Needless to say, I think the lasting legacy of Francis Ford Coppola as a filmmaker will always be what he did in the 1970s with stuff like The Godfather, The Godfather Part 2, and Apocalypse Now, even The Godfather Part 3 in 1990. And yeah, he is certainly not in a better place right now. But look, I know for, I know that he's been getting a bad rap lately, but it's always that type of thing where you got to look at the art. The, you have to separate the artist from the art. And yeah, Francis Ford Coppola right now, complete scumbag. But back in the day, I mean, he was he was one of those great directors who just gave you hit after hit after hit. I mean, The Conversation, The Godfather movies, Apocalypse Now. The 1970s, he had it all. And then there's the 1980s, which is a very interesting time period. I mean, he made a lot of really good movies. There was a lot of movies that weren't that great. But most of them were really... Most of them were films that did not perform well and have been kind of overlooked and have been seen mostly as cult films. And um, it's a shame because most of these movies that are, are part of this are actually some really good movies that definitely deserve a lot more attention. So for this particular episode, I want to cover the, fan the Francis Ford Coppola movies in the 1980s. The movies that you probably don't think about as much, but you should definitely check some of these out because they are actually really, really good movies. And I think not, no better way to start off with that than to look at the first movie that Coppola did after Apocalypse Now, which was the highly ambitious 1982 fantasy film, One from the Heart. One from the Heart was released in 1982, and it starred Frederick Forrest, Terry Garr, Raul Julian, Nastasia Kinski, Lainey Kazan, and Harry Dean Stanton, in a story about the, about the events of Independence Day in Las Vegas, where Hank, a mechanic, and Franny, a travel agent, break up while celebrating their fifth anniversary. He's been insensitive to her yearning and for adventure and excitement as they both spend a night with their idealized partners. Hank goes with Lay Layla, a circus performer, and Franny goes with Ray, a waiter who passes him off as a cocktail pianist and singer. As a, after a mutual nights away from each other, Hank breaks down, tracks Franny to the motel room she and Ray are in, and abducts Franny. Franny refuses to stay with Hank. Hank follows Franny to the airport, where Franny is about to leave for her dream trip to Bora Bora. Hank sings to Franny about proving that he's willing to be more romantic, but Franny boards the plane, and go Hank goes home, distraught, and about to burn her clothes when Franny returns, realizing they've made a mistake. And unlike a movie like Heaven's Gate, the story behind One from the Heart Falling Family at the Box Office might have had more to do with the studio problems than the actual release of the film, as the film changed studios nearly a month before the movie came out. A screening was in California in August of 81, and a lot of exhibitors backed out of releasing the film. Paramount was going to release the film in February of 82. They actually held Oscar consideration screenings in December of 81. They were going to, but eventually backed out on it. And he was perceived that Paramount wanted to focus on Oscar campaigns for Reds and Ragtime, but the studio insisted that they didn't want to pose a threat to the wide release. So... The film was booked for a preview on January 15th, 1982 without the authorization of Paramount, and Paramount basically dropped out of the project altogether, and so Coppola had to take it over to Columbia Pictures at the last minute. So yeah, Coppola kind of screwed over his own movie from getting a bigger release as Columbia barely had time to promote the movie, and the film unfortunately bombed hard at the box office, and it's a shame because this movie is an incredible piece of work, mostly because of the visual style. The cinematography in the movie is fantastic to look at. The shots are gorgeous to look at. A lot of great music in here. Great cinematography by Vittorio Satoro and Ronald Victor Garcia. The music by Crystal Gale and Tom Waits was great. The cast is amazing. It's definitely one of his most underrated movies and definitely one that should be given another se a second look. It is really an incredible, incredible movie that not a lot of people have recently gotten a chance, have gotten a chance to talk about. But recently, the film finally came out on 4K, so now you can check it out for yourself, and I do recommend checking it out because it is indeed worth the watch. Following that up in 1983, he did a film adaptation of the classic S.E. Hinton book, The Outsiders, which was a big hit, both critically and financially, and featured a ton of the hottest young stars at the time. Uh, Matt Dillon, Ralph Macchio, C. Thomas Howell, Patrick Swayze, Rob Lowe, Emilio Estevez, Diane Lane, Tom Cruise... A really good movie, and it was a hit. It was both a critical and financial success. It actually won the few big critical and financial successes for Coppola at the time, and it was a film that I think a lot of people have ver been very familiar with. Some people might not be familiar with the, with the other movie that he directed that was based off of an S.E. Hinton book called Rumblefish. 
which was shot in black and white as an homage to Germany expressionist, expressionist films, and centers on the relationship between a revered former gang leader played by Mickey Rourke and his younger brother played by Matt Dillon. That film did not do so well. It only earned about two and a half million dollars against a ten million dollar budget. But again, a really stylish and impressive looking film in general. It's a film that really does show a lot of potential for. It does. It does still show, basically what it still does is still show that Francis Ford Coppola still knows how to make a really good movie and. Like it's still, it's an impressively put together film from a visual perspective, from an acting perspective. All the actors in here are really good, and it's a shame that it never found its audience back then. But it has gone on, like with the other films we're going to delve into here. It has gone on to have that big cult following to it. And then he followed it up with the Cotton Club in 1984, and the Cotton Club was a movie that was about it was a lavish 1930s era drama where Harlem's legendary Cotton Club becomes a hotbed of passion and violence as the lives of lovers and entertainers and gangsters collide. And uh, the film was, you know, it's really, it's another one of those movies that kind of like One from the Heart and Rumblefish really was very stylized, very ambitious, features a phenomenal cast that includes Richard Gere, Gregory Hines, Diane Lane, Lynette McKee, Bob New Bob Hoskins, James Romare, Nicolas Cage, uh, Fred Gwynn, Lawrence Fishburne, just another really good movie that sadly does not get the proper respect it deserves. And yeah, it was a very stylized movie. Some great music all around. The music is done by um, John Barry, and it's just it's just a really really good movie, man. It just does not get the proper respect it deserves. Kind of like with a lot of the movies I'm going to delve into here. But um, he also did stuff like uh, he did an episode of the Shelley Duvall series Fairy Tale Theater. He did Captain EO for Disney, which of course starred Michael Jackson and was produced by George Lucas. Uh, 1986 saw probably his most successful movie of the decade when Peggy Sue Got Married, which is, it came out a year after Back to the Future and centers around a, young, um, a woman named Peggy Sue, played by Kathleen Turner, who attends her 25th year high school reunion and is about to divorce her, divorce her husband, played by Nicolas Cage, and she finds herself tra transported back to her days in high school in 1960. And it was a very well-received movie. The film did very well at the box office and actually got several Oscar nominations, including at Best Actress one for Kathleen Turner. Um, it's a really good movie, a really good film, probably easily the biggest hit that Coppola had in the, in the 1980s, and one that I don't think I really need to say too much about in terms of a great film in general. But um, after that, it was more mixed than what it was. The next film he did was uh, the movie Gardens of Stone with James Caan, which was a movie about a it's a movie about an idealistic soldier played by James Caan who arrives at Fort Myer expecting to go to the academy and then to the Vietnam War. Jackie is the son of a veteran sergeant and soon he becomes the protege of the former friends of his fathers, Sergeant Chloe Hazard and Sergeant Major Goody Nelson. Jackie is promoted and gets married with a childhood fr with his childhood friend Rachel Fell to recommend Jackie to the academy. He's promoted to lieutenant and asked to go to the Vietnam uh, War, returning to the Arlington National Cemetery. And, um, yeah, it's a movie that has some good ambitions to it, had a lot of high ambitions to it, but just felt like a movie that was felt like Coppola was Oscar-baiting again. And usually he did a pretty good job of hiding it for the most part, but this is definitely one you could tell that he was really trying to go for another Academy Award. For, for it, and it just didn't work this time around. It just wasn't a great film in general. Uh, I thought he turned it around with his next movie, Tom T uh, Tucker, The Man and His Dream. I'm thinking of the Family Guy episode, but no. The, the next movie he did was Tucker, The Man and His Dream, which has uh, Jeff Bridges in it as inventor Preston Tucker, who and he recounts the st and it recounts the story of his attempt to produce the Trucker 48, which was met with scandal between the big three automobile manufacturers and the accusations of stock fraud from the U.S. Security and Exchanges Commission. And uh, again, featuring a lot of really good performances in here. Joan Allen, Martin Landau, Elias Codius, Frederick Forrest, Christian Slater. Um, really good movie. A really damn good film overall. And just shows how much Jeff Bridges has matured as an actor in the in that decade. And just it also helps that you have George Lucas as one of the producers as well. Just a really good movie, man. One that I've talked about before in depth on Time About the Movie's Flashback. One that I as I'll definitely recommend checking that out. I'll leave a link to where you can find that particular review at. And then the last movie he did in the 1980s wasn't even really a movie, but it was a piece of an anthology film called New York Stories, which also featured a segment directed by Woody Allen and Martin Scorsese, and the one that Coppola directed was called Life with Zoe, where you have Zoe as a 12-year-old schoolgirl who lives in a luxury hotel. 
She hopes she helps return to, a, to an Arab princess a valuable piece of jewelry that the princess had given to Zoe's father and had been subsequently stolen and recovered. Zoe tries to reconcile with, his divor with her divorced mother, a photographer, a fa and father, a flatulist. Not every segment in New York Stories worked in particular, and I think if I, if I remember right with this one, I think I did say that it was either Woody Allen or, Mar or Francis Ford Coppola I thought was the best one, I think. Let me double check just to make sure here. Uh, if I remember, it's like, no, I think I said, Mar I think I did say Martin, I take that back on both of them. Martin Scorsese's Life Lessons was the one I think was the best overall. Not to say that it w all of them were bad or anything in general, just the first one by Martin Scorsese is easily the best of the bunch, and the other ones are just okay, but they don't really add a whole lot to it. And I'll give them no effort for trying to do something with it, but it just... It just unfortunately didn't work out, and it kind of ended the decade for Coppola on kind of a low note, especially considering the next year he would have to uh, put uh, put his American Zoetrope company into bankruptcy. But he did have a couple of hits to start the decade off in the nineteen in the nineteen nineties. The Godfather Part Three, while not as successful as Godfather One and Two, was still a successful movie critically and commercially. And yeah, it's definitely the weakest of the three Godfather movies, but it's still a really good Godfather movie. And he even had a good one with uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula in 1992, which is a really good, is a really fun, fun, good, decent adaptation of Dracula. And that led him to produce Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which I think is criminally underrated, directed by Kenneth Branagh. And then that's where kind of the downfall started to begin. The f and then you ha it was with Jack really being the movie that kind of ruined all the goodwill that Coppola had. It was it, That felt like a movie that Coppola was forced to make and just like... Just the whole idea alone of Robin Williams playing a kid, playing a kid inside who's maturing, who on the outside is maturing, what was it, four times faster than he, he actually is. Just like a very confusing plot indeed, and just the movie just falls apart almost immediately. The Rainmaker was kind of a mixed bag overall. Youth without youth was not that was not as good. Neither was Tetro or Twix. Megalopolis, I think, can go one of two ways. Honestly, I'm not to is mean. I'm cautiously optimistic, but at the same time, this is a movie he's been wanting to make for years. It's a passion project, and most passion projects don't usually end up as well as I think they do, they expect them to. But, um, but yeah, uh, yeah, Francis Ford Coppola has made a lot of good movies, basically. Like, yeah, everyone's going to remember the Godfather movies and Apocalypse Now and the conversation, but the movies he made in the 1980s were mostly very good. Only a few little exceptions here and there that were not as good, but... I'd highly recommend checking out One from the Heart. I'd highly recommend The Out the Outsiders, Rumblefish, The Cotton Club, Peggy Sue Got Married, uh, Tucker the Man in His Dream. I'd definitely give those ones a watch. And you could see that Coppola did have a very good decade in the 1980s in terms of the movies he made, just not in the money that he made after that. I mean, none of them were big fit hits in general, except for Peggy Sue Got Married and The Outsiders. But other than that, though, none of them were big hit hits critically. None of them were big hits financially, but they were films that definitely deserve a lot of attention. I am glad to see that some of them are getting cult followings nowadays, especially One from the Heart and The Cotton Club. These are definitely movies you should definitely check out, so definitely give those ones a watch. Uh, if you want to see what I had to say last week about Kevin Costner's mo Big Gambles in Hollywood, I'll leave a link to that video in the corner, and you can also check out some of the other episodes I've done here. And uh, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.